Well, a lot of moving pieces in the war in Ukraine. Over the past 24 hours, we heard from Russia that they are, in fact, now fighting the full weight and force of NATO. Of course, we've been saying this as the Ukrainian military has all but collapsed. So NATO ramping up additional heavy weapons, heavy tanks. The United States announcing their largest tranche of weapons and money going to Ukraine, another $3 billion. Germany, France, Italy and Poland. Now, Poland is a story that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in the mainstream media. It has been largely ignored, but this country is collapsing under the weight of millions of Ukrainian refugees. And it's odd, a country that it continues to support the war in Ukraine, continues to funnel weapons and money into that country, despite the fact that Poland is essentially collapsing. For that, we want to bring in independent journalist Derek Monroe, who is uh, just returned from Poland not too long ago, also returned from Ukraine, and is heading back to Poland uh, later this week. Uh, Derek, thank you so much for your coverage and joining us here on Redacted. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. So tell us what you were just in the Donbass not too long ago. You were watching what has been unfolding. Um, and we're hearing some conflicting numbers between the number of refugees that have been pouring across the border into Poland. What are the latest numbers uh, that you're hearing that have gone into Poland and are essentially crushing that country's services to be able to even provide for these people? Uh, a correction, I was actually in Bukovina, which is western part of Ukraine, next to uh, Romania, hu Romania, Hungary, and Poland, Slovakia. Okay, so um, you were on the border right there with Poland then. That's right. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the problems with the refugees is truly amazing because um, it seems like the, all the height of the wave of the refugees were coming back uh, following immediate attack of the of Russians in February kind of subsided because the issue became a little bit less uh, political on the humanitarian side. But the numbers are increasing right now, specifically when uh, Russian military is attacking civilian infrastructure in the wintertime, which uh, provides a lot of the Russian uh, Ukrainian cities to be without gas or electricity. So uh, even Ukrainian government, Zelensky's government, is saying to people, basically, if you really want to live in a normal, you know, civilized conditions, you better leave the country. And, and basically, most of the people are leaving for Poland right now. And the situation is re really dire. Um, they're expecting more people coming in in the coming weeks. Right now, the estimates are between 3.8 to 4.2 million Ukrainians living in Poland alone, which are being housed in a variety of different uh, scenarios like houses, private homes, uh, schools, which are being converted. You know, uh, there are some sports centers which are also being trans transferred to some kind of refugee makeshift centers. And... Um, and the most fundamental issue, which I think a lot of people don't want to address on both governmental level and the c civilian level, is that Poland is really not a very wealthy country that can, can really afford to take care of this. So this is really also creating a lot of uh, dissonance within this Polish society where there are a lot of different uh, aids and a lot of different social programs or even healthcare, which was normally reserved and provided for the Polish people, are now be being basically diverted to Ukrainians. And uh, by the whole, and it's by the whole dynamics of, of the numbers, the people who are paying for a lot of the services for their own taxes are not getting the services anymore. So this is really truly becoming a uh, political domestic issue as well. Now, I've been hearing from a lot of Polish viewers who say, look, Clayton, we can't get the information out of Poland. Like what, when we try to get accurate information about what's actually happening, we're being censored. We're not getting access to news here. And they do not want this war. And so there seems to me from the Polish, uh, the Polish views that I'm hearing and the sources speaking to the government that I've been speaking to, there's a big disconnect here from what the Polish government and its support of NATO and the Polish people. And, you know, it's how did the how did the Polish government become such a sidekick of the United States in in Ukraine? Well, it's a longest story that goes back to 1989, where they have a changeover with the government, where they nominally came from communist system to so-called free economic capitalist system. Um, it turned out, uh, uh, fast forward to back to tw tw uh, 2020, 2015, where Peace Party, the current ruling party, took over after the uh, elections where they defeated the neoliberal PO party, the plat platform of Batelska. Uh, the, comp, uh, the country itself became sort of a quasi-socialist, quasi-right-wing uh, uh, Catholic party, which wanted to emphasize of Polish nationalism, Polish history, in order to bring lowest common den denominator of patriotism to kind of collect uh, groupthink and sort of a 
uh, regurgitate all the all the good talking points from a right wing to be to have the most popular appeal. And they also have instilled, just like in Orban in Hungary, a lot of social programs specifically directed to towards alleviating poverty in Polish society, let's say 500 plus, which was supposed to help the Polish citizens to have children to basically eradicate um, poverty among more, or more children, which I think was a really big issue until then. And unfortunately, you have a political system that it's basically regurgitating not only the talking points from the West, but it's also it's been has been infiltrated by basically uh, Western NATO and a variety of different uh, players who are simply are performing a function of the state, which supposedly be uh, qualifies itself as independent and sovereign, but all the major foreign policy decisions has been outsourced, whether to Brussels or to Washington D.C. So you have a sort of a very much a cognitive dissonance here where you have a very much a nationalist rhetoric towards implementing a variety of different social programs and building up country as a one individual uh, homogeneous unit. Well, on the other hand, you have a de facto political powers that, mess it, mess, that, that give not only messaging, but ultimate uh, military and a political support to Ukraine. Which, which have had a very, very complicated history going back, even going before World War II, but specifically since World War II, where there are major massacres in Volhynia in 1943, where uh, up to 150,000 Poles were massacred by, by uprisings of Ukrainian nationalists against the Poles. So it's, it's got a situation here. We, we have a situation here, which is sort of a uh, three-dimensional chess where uh, there's a very heavy rhetoric on the nationalism, patriotism, helping the Ukrainians and helping a variety of different people to achieve certain goals. But it's also a the Polish state itself has been sort of decapitated from a decision making power. It's it's gotten itself to the point of grotesqueness where they basically giving away their military equipment for free to Ukrainians. And uh, the latest news was the Leopard tanks, which were they themselves bought from Germany, which were used, which a lot of those tanks required lots of capital outlay investment to actually bring up to the modern standards, you know, uh, to fix them up, what have you. And now they've been transferred to the Ukrainian side for next to nothing. This, this is unbelievable. So they buy them from Germany. So the Polish military buys them from Germany. They're in Poland. Now they're giving them to Ukraine essentially for free. Of course, we know we've been covering here on this show that the Ukrainian military, the manpower, the expertise to run a lot of this heavy equipment, they don't have it. So it's a lot of... Up. Yeah, a lot of NATO forces are being used to run these different pieces of equipment. Can you speak to the Polish military, Polish soldiers inside of Ukraine? Are How many of them? Do you happen to have a number? We've certainly seen reports of this. Um, how many there might be and how are they actually actively in the front lines using these heavy equipment? Well, there are a variety of different video reports, uh, as, go as well as going back last week, where uh, the Polish TV was, uh, TVN for that matter, was showing up some reports around uh, Kharkiv, and they saw several soldiers with the Polish uh, flags on the uniforms. Uh, so uh, this is a standard issue military equipment that's used to Poland. The Polish, the Polish government official uh, stand on the issue is that there's these are quote unquote volunteers that went to fight over there. Right. And... Um, What's interesting, uh, right now, there's talk about between 1,100 or 1,200 Poles that actually became casualties of this war. However, the coverage of the funerals has completely been eradicated from, a, from the mass conscience Polish media. Polish media simply does not report on it. So occasionally you will see some uh, lo local newspaper or some local bulletin board uh, explain what well, this young man died in Ukraine, and we have a service for him today, and you know, so on and so forth. But this is sort of out of sight, out of mind. So it's sort of like a very much an undercover situation. It's almost like a psyops operation that is actually being run uh, into a variety of different parts of Ukraine, where those people actually wind up joining uh, Ukrainian forces, whether they're mercenaries or simple various volunteers. It's really hard to tell. Uh, but but there are definitely people who are operating some of the equipment that came from NATO and being donated to Ukrainians. Uh, but once again, uh, it's very difficult to confirm those issues. You literally have to go on the ground. And if you're not an embed, then you obviously, uh, if you're an independent journalist, you, you have a lot of problems reporting from it because you might be considered basically a spy or uh, someone who does a enemy propaganda and get yourself a lot of trouble and arrested, for example. Unbelievable. So, I mean, we are in an information war and you were there covering this. This is why we're hearing from so many Polish viewers that say we can't get any information. 
Our government is lying to us, keeping this hidden. The media is keeping this hidden from us. You were there on the ground. So what pushback did you get? Because you were on the border there. You were watching unbel- the flood of people heading into Poland. What were you hearing from Ukrainian government officials? Were they asking you to keep certain things quiet, trying to hide certain things from you, from your reporting? And what were you hearing from the Polish side? Have they been happy with your reporting? I think it's definitely there is some degree of coordination of the messaging, uh, which uh, basically kind of tends to kind of create some kind of degree of uh, consolidated narrative. What's going on within, uh, let's say, civilian population in Ukraine itself, and what's going on within, uh, let's say, the front lines. Uh, my sources were telling me uh, people who are coming back from from the from the uh, from the front, which I discussed met several people while I was over there. The first and foremost complaint was that most of the aid or military equipment that's supposed to be going to the units is not getting there. Uh, I was given a variety of different uh, estimates between 25 to 30 percent of stuff that actually sent to them actually arrives and everything else sort of disappears on the way. So uh, there are a lot of complaints regarding uh, the equipment that's being sent over from Europe, for example, that's obsolete, built in 60s and 70s and 80s that uh, sometimes you can't even get uh, ammunition for it or stuff is not really not functioning. So it's uh, this is especially coming from the stuff from Germany. Germany has been donating quite a lot of like, military equipment, sort of a uh, personal, not only personal motorized carriers, but also um, in Sweden as well, like uh, tow missiles type of uh, anti-tank uh, equipment. S- uh, some of the stuff, quite a bit, quite a lot of the stuff actually doesn't work because it's been so, it's basically been obsolete. So. Uh, it's almost a, sort of a paradoxical situation where the West gives a lot of lip service to Ukrainian forces that, yes, we want to give you the best possible uh, you know, help that you can get, the best possible equipment, but actually what arrives is different. It's quite possible that maybe the good stuff is being picked out and then shipped out to Africa or someplace like this. Recently, about t- uh, 10 days ago, the pres- President Obasanjo of Nigeria actually stating, stated that actually a lot of the weapons that originally were destined for, uh, for, Pol- for from, U- from Poland to Ukraine is now showing up in, in Mali and in, in northern Nigeria. So it seems like there's a, definitely a trade going on somewhere where some of the weapons are basically based, be, being monetized, being sold in the black market. So now that's you- part, part one of the reasons. Yeah, uh, yeah, we've certainly been covering the reports here on this show about a lot of these weapons uh, just winding up on the black market, very little of them actually making it to to the mm-hmm. people who uh, apparently need it. When you were in when you were in Ukraine just a few months ago, you were at the border. What did you witness on the Ukrainian side heading into Poland because you were telling me a little bit before the show and I think it's I think it's fascinating and I want to, I want our viewers to hear this. What I find extremely amazing is that um the Ukrainian government itself simply doesn't care for its own people. They, they, the very limited amount of help that's being given, it's simply nothing's comparison to what Ukrainians really need. So many times local officials, let's say in Bukovina area where I was when I spoke with them, they tell me that they have no resources to help their own people. They just simply t- tell them, go to Poland, go to Romania, go to Hungary. That's where help is waiting for you. So in a way, they are just sort of a passing the buck. Plus, there's also a situation where a lot of the refugees coming from eastern part of Ukraine, which is Russian speaking, doesn't particularly get along or it's liked in Western Ukraine, which is Ukrainian, uh, going back generations. So they also consider there's definitely a lot of animosity between uh, on a cultural basis as well as the language basis itself. So in a way, it kind of creates a situation where uh, the government itself tries to portray itself as a great custodian of the people that's fighting a heroic war, but the reality in Ukraine is completely different. And this is really kind of hurtful because, uh, you know, uh, those people are being put in this into the situ- war situation, not a fault of their own. This is really something that most people don't realize when there's a narrative which is being spanned about uh, February 20. Uh, 2022 invasion, people are looking at this situation, that's when the war started, when in fact, this whole thing started in 2014 uh, at, at the Euromaidan Square, uh, February 20th, 2014, which I actually happened to witness the coup. I was actually there at the square. Wow. When I saw all the fighting, how, how this all happened, transpired. So in a way, um, there's definitely very different narrative that's being spent in the Polish and the Ukrainian and Western media versus really what happened. And this is really uh, something very strange from someone who's looking 
at this from a Western American perspective is, well, it kind of follows the stereotypes of good guy versus bad guy, you know, uh, good Ukrainians, uh, good, West, good Westerners versus the evil Putin, for example, where the, they, where, where the reality and grade is really mixed and much more nuanced. Because both sides commit war crimes, both sides mistreat their own, uh, mistreat their own, uh, you know, prisoner population, uh, the POWs, for example. And there's been many documented uh, facts of, of the Ukrainians committing war crimes as well as Russians. This, this, this unfortunately happens in war, you know. And so West tries to kind of portray this whole thing sort of from a standardized situation where there's a very clear victim and a very, very clear aggressor. Where if you really look in microcosm of the military uh, engagements on the ground, things can be very different from from hour to hour depending on dynamic of the battlefield. So it's really strange. And you're going to be heading back there uh, this week, bringing aid, bringing uh, provisions, supplies to the Polish people. Um, and so that's amazing. You're going to be bringing because they are in need right now. I mean, they they are literally suffering. Um, <laughs> And we'll have a link in the description if people want to donate a Facebook page from a group that uh, you're affiliated with that is going to be bringing some of these supplies. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the aid that you're bringing to the Polish people? Well, I have had a very good luck of uh, fund, um, bringing my own uh, help, as well as I would like to thank Jewel Askel supermarket chain here, which is part of Albertsons. They don donated an amazing amount of uh, sweets and candies and chocolate for the kids, as well as uh, some small miscellaneous items, which actually, which I'm bringing uh, in just on my own uh, to, to this organization. And British Airways have to be kind enough to donate the cargo space. So this is something which I normally do not do, but I see the need is so great. Right. I, you know, just what I, what I saw there just when I was there in, in October. So I, simply it is essentially a business trip for me i decided to simply to do something about this so you know people people can often complain you know this and that but it's like it's getting to a point where i have an opportunity to really make a difference i and obviously it's very small 50 kilograms not going to change anything but it's obviously it's try to somebody to, to do somebody it'll, yeah yeah and we'll have Whatever a link in that our description so if anyone wants to any any polish families who you know or, or anyone who wants to donate and be able to help the people because again these are governments pushing uh, and, and making these people suffer and not the people themselves. And that's really at the heart of all sure. of this. Derek Monroe, we really appreciate you joining us here before your flight. Uh, thank you for shedding some light on what's happening with the Polish, uh, with the Polish people right now and to have a safe trip and we'll have you back on real soon. Sure. Thank you very much. End time. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching this segment here at Redacted. We are live every day at 4 p.m. Eastern time trying to share the stories that the mainstream media will not cover. You should also come over and join our community of Redacted Rebels over at Redacted.inc. That's our private locals community where we can share exclusive content that we simply cannot share here on YouTube. Come over and join the rebellion together right now by going to Redacted.inc. We'll see you next time.